welcome to the Sex Ed for the Modern Bed Show with your spicy hosts, Tara and Sylvie. We show up every episode to expose, uncover, and share what we know about SEX. This isn't what you'll find in your typical sex ed class. Juicy sex talk is under discussed, and we're doing what we can to change that. Sex is evolving. People are empowered more than ever to detach from cultural norms and design the sex life they crave. And hey, if you're looking for more after the show, we invite you to get social. Our Instagram is the.sexed.show, and we would love for you to give us a follow or slide into our DMs. <laughs> slide in. <laughs> That's hot. Mm. What makes someone stand out as a lover? How do you go from okay to amazing between the sheets? Today, Sylvie and I invite our friend and fellow practitioner in training, Solaz, onto the show to share her experiences, tips, and more when it comes to luscious loving. Solaz has a diverse background in education and holistic healing modalities. She's a licensed body worker, certified communication and mirror work coach, trauma-informed and pleasure-based somatic sex educator. She's devoted to helping people of all sexual orientations discover pleasure while honoring their voice and choice and has lots of valuable info to bring to today's topic. The three of us touch on our recollections of luscious lovers, tips for before, during, and after getting intimate, and how luscious loving lands in your body. And before we get started, I'd like to express gratitude to those who reside here, and I want to honor the Indigenous people who have lived and worked on this land historically and presently. This is the traditional territories of the Indigenous people of the Treaty 7 Territory and Métis Nation of Alberta Region 3. I respect the histories, languages, and cultures of the First Nation, Métis, Inuit, and all First Peoples of Canada, whose presence continues to enrich our community. And Salaz said that she would be willing to share the somatic inquiry to start us off for the show. Salaz, we gave a little intro and we're so happy you're here. What are you thinking of sharing with us today? Hey, thanks for having me here. It's such a pleasure to be <laughs> in your presence, uh, you, Tara, and Sylvie. Yes, I would love to invite uh, you two and our guest listeners to start with a somatic inquiry. And for today, I've chosen this question, how does it feel to be in your body today? So if everyone could take a deep breath in. Mm. Mix that with a sound, maybe, or a movement. And then wherever you are, you might be sitting, you might be standing, you might be driving. Try to take this moment to feel how your body is responding to the stimuli around you right now and to my voice and to the subject of this podcast today, what it is to be a luscious lover how do you feel in your body when you think about that? What comes up for you? Can you describe it with words? It could be a color, it could be a sound, it could be a texture. And if you feel like sharing, Sylvie and Tara. Mm. Sylvie, do you want to go first? Well, the part of my body that I associate with being a luscious lover are my lips. So I think I was noticing how they feel today. Just the, and I've been sort of biting on them because, you know, in, in winter when it gets cold and we all get kind of dry skin and those of us who don't use chapstick religiously, that's me. I don't use chapstick, unfortunately. I always lose mine in my bag. Um, and so my lips are constantly dry and then like a little bit cracked or peeling, but sometimes it can feel fun to explore that with my tongue or when I just bite on it and I can get that feeling of it feels pleasurable, but it also feels painful a little bit at the same time. And sometimes I enjoy doing that. And when Solas was doing that inquiry, I think that's what was coming up for me was 
how many different textures I can have just on my lip surface. It can be soft and it can be dry and it can they can be wet and they can be so many different things and they provide so much sensation. So that was what was going through my mind. What about for you, Tara? Mm. Like I'm just noticing how cold I am in my office sitting here because <laughs> I had to turn the heater off. And like my body's like craving warmth like a bath or to be under covers. And right now I'm in sweatshirt and toque and everything. So I think I was really like filling into what part of my body is warm and like my throat feels really warm and my pussy feels really warm. And then the contrast of like my really cold hands, like there's so much temperature difference I think yeah it was like really noticing temperature for this one which usually doesn't happen to me very often unless somebody mentions the temperature to me like oh pay attention to the temperature what do you notice um yeah so I, I, I'm craving the warmth but I was noticing different temperature changes mm. yeah thank you Solaz that was actually perfect for today Thank you. Thanks for sharing. Do you want to share anything? Even though you were guiding it? Yeah, I was guiding it. So, I mean, the sensation that I was feeling as I was guiding was uh, a deep sense of peace and feeling tingliness in my entire body, basically. And I'm also sitting um, in a in the lotus position right now on my couch. And so I can feel like my ankles touching the couch and my seat bones being like pulled down into the cushion, the cushion. So that's also where my attention went to those parts of my body. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Is there also anything that you would like to share before we kind of started getting into this? I know I mentioned some things in the intro, but I always like to give the option. I, I was going to share my territorial acknowledgement. Yeah. Yeah, where I'm at. I occupy the land of the Kanaka people, also known as the people of the Hawaiian Islands. I'm on Oahu, the island of Oahu. And I always, I always like to, you know, share my gratefulness for being able to occupy this land, which is not mine, but that I can enjoy abundantly for all that it provides for me and I call it home so it's a very special place for me and yeah deep gratitude for being here mm -hmm. yeah I love watching all of your stories on Instagram when I'm freezing my ass off in the winter <laughs> <laughs> like oh this looks lovely I should go for a visit yeah <laughs> We should. We should definitely go for a visit. We should both come. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So since all three of us were in SSE training together, have we noticed a shift in our bodies in being more particular about who has access to, the, to our bodies? And have we noticed if there's any changes that we have felt in our own self-pleasure practice since coming back from our in-person intensive in Canada a couple of months ago. Yeah, because all three of us were there together. Yeah. <laughs> okay, Tara, do you do you have Yeah, Tara, right, go for it. You go for it first. <laughs> oh goodness. Of like what I've noticed shifting. It's been a subtle shift since I started. But then I also started like during COVID. And so I think that also shifted my sexuality and and provided me with spaciousness to really discover what I wanted and what I what I craved and what I didn't want to. And one of the biggest things I've noticed is <laughs> saying bye-bye to my people pleasing, like that I used to not even, I didn't even know it was there. And it wasn't until I started this training and did the like a pro training with Dr. Betty Martin 
that was like, oh my gosh, I endured a lot, especially like in the non-monogamous community in the lifestyle. And uh, I just kind of went along with it thinking that I had to endure and, or that's like what it was and um, taking that break at the start of COVID and then starting in school, you know, I really realized that I needed more of a connection with people and I needed to be able to trust them. I needed to trust that my no would be respected and that they were interested in what my desires were and asked questions and checked in. And it wasn't just P and V sex, like penetrative sex. And also noticing things like what would kind of give me an ick, like, like, like talking in a group of people. And if somebody like starts like rubbing my back or, you know, the people like that tap your shoulder when they talk, I'm just like, Oh, like yeah, it's all, all your face. <laughs> we all like cringed our face. Like it just little things like that. I'm like, if you can't even respect my personal space with our clothes on in a very chill environment, how, how can I know that you're going to respect my body and my space and my limits when we're naked or had a few drinks or cocktails and we're, you know, getting intimate. So I think those are probably the main shifts for me. Yeah. Everything that you just said is the conversation I had last night with my lover. (laughs) Exactly. Well, it's good to have those conversations because it, it like, these weren't conversations I was having before or even questioning. Absolutely. Yeah. 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 What about you, Sylvie? Do you have anything you want to, you want to add or share? I think the people pleasing is a really ongoing struggle, right? Um, For me, at least I can't say, oh, I used to be a people pleaser and now I'm not. I think I have never been a true people pleaser except in some aspects. And those aspects are very much culturally ascribed to my role as a cis woman in society and what is expected when it comes to sex with cis men. Mm -hmm. That I don't think that it's enough if there isn't P and V, right? If there's no penetration that somehow, even if my partner is saying that's fine, that that cultural guilt still is inside of me where I'm like, well, but is he really satisfied because did he get enough, right? And Mm -hmm. we don't ask ourselves these questions for any other type of relationship, right? We're very expansive with what we believe sex to be when it's between, you know, different genders or... And we're perfectly happy to accept oral sex as being sex when it comes to sex between women, for example, right? But when it's, when it's, when a man is there and his penis is there, we're sort of still culturally expected to do something with it. Mm -hmm. And that's still something that I struggle with, even as a sexological body worker, even after having discussions with, with my husband, with my partner, and sort of saying, you know, is this something that needs to happen every time? And, you know, being reassured that no, it's not. And and yet it is still something that comes up as a feeling inside of me. And so I think just working on it over and over again and sort of challenging those notions that culturally we all have the set of ideas of what we have to do and the touches that we must endure and the things, I mean, let's not even talk about romantic sexual touch, we still all believe that we have to endure medical touch that we don't particularly like without saying anything. That if somebody who is a medical professional tells you to get on a table and put your legs in the stirrups, that we do it because we think, well, it's for my own good. I I must do it because, and we don't say, oh, do you have anything a little bit more comfortable than stirrups? Or I don't think I'm ready to do that yet because we know that the doctor is very busy and doesn't have time for us to warm up to that idea. And so we still do put ourselves in situations where we endure and when our body doesn't feel good because we think, well, we just, we have to. And I think that even as somatic sex educators, we still come across those moments in our lives that we struggle with. Absolutely. And, yeah. 
you know, <laughs> just because we have this training. I had a teacher once who told me that just because I have the tools doesn't mean that I always use them. Right. And that has really stuck with me because often I find myself in situations, personal situations where I think, uh, if only I was a sexological body worker or a somatic sex educator right now, I would so know what to do. And then I laugh at myself because it's funny because I do have the tools and st- still sometimes I do not use them. And that is an interesting place for us to examine when we come up to these moments where we think, well, I don't want to, but I'm going to. Why? Why are we going to? And in the moment, maybe we don't feel like doing that deep dive and maybe it's worth doing the deep dive once in a while just to figure out what is at the end of that weed that we're trying to pull Mm -hmm. yeah I definitely understand the cultural subscription to like a hetero hetero get together (laughs) but it is it's interesting It, it changes dynamics when you're with somebody who's not a cis male And there's also, you know, that factor of like, I don't want to make a scene, right? You Mm -hmm. don't want to be difficult. The last thing you want to do is for someone to be like, well, you're just being dramatic. Right. Right. Like if you walk into a, you know, walk into a Starbucks and there's a person in front of you who happens to be a, a lovely, gentle, older man, right? And he turns around and says, oh, you have a beautiful smile and you're looking so beautiful today. And you literally came in just because you wanted to grab a coffee and go. And you've got right. this older man talking to you in front of you. And then and then he just puts his hand on you and, and says, oh, you're so beautiful. Just cut cut my line in the queue. You're welcome. And you just think, get your fucking hands off me. Yeah. But you can't even true. say that because they just did something nice to you and they complimented you and they said nice things. And then it's like, if I'm the person who's going to be like, don't touch me, get off me. You didn't ask if you could touch me then other people are going to look at you as if you're a horrible person Mm -hmm. because this old man literally just said lovely things to you, let you cut in line. And now you're going to be a drama queen and talk about consent. Yeah. Oh my God. So that can come up inside of all of us where we think, oh, just let it go. It's okay. Like he was just being nice. Yeah. And I'm being unreasonable. I shouldn't, it shouldn't matter that he put his hand on my shoulder. Who cares? But it's enduring. Yeah, I've been having a lot of uh, a lot of situations like this one where now my body literally like has this reaction of you, you know, yeah, don't even come close to me and things that men say to me uh, when I was on my way back from Maui from my mini retreat with Coco, this guy like on the airplane like walked to me and said to me, oh, you look sensational today. And although I felt like very flattered by that comment, my body was also like, oh no, here we go again, another one. You Mm -hmm. know, what does he want from me? Of course, there is some attraction there. Obviously, that's obvious. But did I want to feel that? No, I don't want to feel that. I don't want to feel what I'm feeling right now in my body, that level of uncomfortability because of what he just said. Like it just put me in a different place, you know, in my mind. And at the airport, when we landed, he actually followed me all the way to the carousel where I was picking up my luggages. He didn't even have any luggage to pick up. And he came to me and again, he's like, you know, asking me questions. Do you have kids? Are you married? Uh, You know, can I have your number? And he's like, I love your look. And you know what? I did give him my number, knowing full well that I have no interest in getting to know him. I don't even want him to know me either. And I still had that programming in my mind where I'm like, people pleaser. What I used to do so much before, you know, just came back at that moment. And I gave him my number. He texted me a couple of times. And again, he's like, I want to get to know you. I loved, I, I loved your look. And and I felt disgusted by that. I'm like, <laughs> seriously, like I'm, before I would have been like, oh, you know, yes. it would have made me feel like I'm special and, oh, I should, I should, um, I should do something in return. You know, I should be nice. You know, like you just said, Sylvie, like you want to be nice because you feel like if you don't, then you're, you're a bitch. Right. Mm-hmm. So 
yeah, he texted me that I never texted him back. I was like, that's not what I want to hear. Like, don't, don't judge me for my looks. Like I'm, I'm, there's something deeper about me than just the way I look mm -hmm. and the way you felt when you saw me, you know, like you got, I don't know, maybe he got a hard on who, who fucking knows? I don't know. But just that, just that thought just made me feel cringy. I was like, you like, no, thanks. Don't approach me like that. Yeah. And I've realized that through this work, through this somatic sex work that we've been doing together, I, it made me really look at situations where I would let myself be in, in you know, in these relationships with, with guys who didn't give a fuck about me, really. It was just physical. It was just, I just wanted to get in my pants. Yeah. And, and I didn't see it. To me, you know, also women, once we have sex with someone, there's a portal that opens up. Like, this, you know, it's, it just changes everything. Like, if I have sex with someone, I'm going to go, I'm going to want to go deep with that person. And most of the time, these guys I was inviting into my life didn't care about that. That's not what I wanted. So I have become very selective in who I let be intimate with me, in who I let mm -hmm. even like, even if it's just being in my space, even if it doesn't involve sex, just being intimate is now it's like, I really have to feel whether my body is like even feeling the slices, the slice, slightest <laughs> discomfort, any, any feeling of no, this might not be a good idea, just pulls me away. And I'm like, I don't want to go there. Like I know right away now what mm -hmm. feels good and what doesn't feel good. So yeah, this work has been amazing in shifting my, my own perception of others and myself and and knowing you know knowing what is all right and what's not yeah yeah and it's interesting because I do notice too now that I'm listening to that part of my body well part of my all of my body I don't feel like a I need to drink as much when I go out to numb those feelings and B, my level of anxiety has gone way, way down. Like there was times where I couldn't even go to some lifestyle events because I was throwing up before because my anxiety was so bad because my body's like, no, you're not taking care of me. And, you know, I've been to a few since and like, no, there's like barely any anxiety because I trust myself. I trust my body. And yeah it it's taken a lot of learning though yeah 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 I, I've I've also have this kind of uh situations at parties at central parties that I've been to and I've been invited to one recently and I had a talk with the host or the hostess because I wanted her to know that I'm not the same person I used to be. Like before I would go to those parties and I would like, you know, get naked right away and start playing, you know, with people. You know, one time I was laying on a massage table and someone was using a glass dildo on me and people were watching. But then I realized that those people didn't deserve to see me like that. But back then, I did not feel that. Back then, I was like, oh, this is amazing. You know, I feel good. You know, I'm a little bit of an uh, exhibitionist. So it felt good to be seen like that. Mm -hmm. but, then also, but now, when I look back at it, I'm like, darn, these people didn't even know me. Mm -hmm. They did not appreciate me for who I am. They don't care about me. They were just there, like, for enjoyment. But... I was basically an object to be looked at. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And so I'm I'm really careful now too when it comes to that those kind of parties. I'm a lot more guarded. I don't expose myself to everybody. You know, again, I'm very selective in who is going to be seeing my naked body and who I'm going to interact with if it happens. 
but yeah, that's also like a major shift that has happened for me since our training. Mm -hmm. You're right. And being able to just say no, not necessarily in a sexual situation, in any kind of situation, just being able to say no, thank you. Being able to say it graciously, if you want to say it graciously, or if you feel as if you have to say it graciously, but also you can say no to family members, right? You can say no to recurring dinner invitations that you don't necessarily want to have. It doesn't necessarily even have to be about your body or touch. We all have boundaries. We all have things that our, that our bodies and our psyches want to do and things that we don't. And becoming more aware of what our wants and desires are, what our neutrals are, and what our no's are has been an incredible learning process. And just even being able to identify what those things are or, you know, something feels neutral to me. Like, okay, I could go either way on this. Okay, cool. Like, is it really neutral or is it because of other reasons? Do I feel like I should? Do I feel like I have to? Do I feel like it's expected of me? And then if, if I don't feel that any of those things are expected, then, and it's a true neutral, then I get to decide that in the moment. If it's a yes, awesome. And if it's a no, how strong of a no is it? Not because I'm going to change my mind, but because some things need to have a very hard line drawn in the sand immediately. And some things can be presented more gentle and lovingly. Right. And I was actually looking while you were speaking, Celeste, I, I had seen a post on Facebook a few days ago and I can't find it now, but somebody had posted something about if a guy asks repeatedly for your number and you still feel that cultural urge to give him a number that people had posted various numbers that you could give that man <laughs> that when he called it it was like a consent hotline <laughs> and he would then get a lecture on consent um oh my god yes <laughs> there were like various things that he would call and he would get told the person who gave you this number thinks you need a lesson in consent <laughs> and then you know press one if you think that this was a mistake press two and like you know and then when you press one you get like oh so you really don't get that you know your presence is not necessarily wanted at all times right so it just gives them a little and I could not find it and I wish I had found the number because then I could give it to our listeners right now but listeners go online and try and find that number because if you do feel that compulsion and as Solas mentioned it's in all of us we don't know why we necessarily do something but sometimes our programming will just kick in mm -hmm. when someone repeatedly pesters us. It feels safer in our body to just think, okay, just give him a number. He's going to go away. Just give him a number. Mm -hmm. And it can be hard to think of a number off the top of your head. That's not your number. And you also don't want them to call it in the moment and see that it's not your phone or whatever else. So you can just give them a number of the consent hotline and when they call it <laughs> they'll become very aware very quickly that they actually violated your boundaries and you didn't have to be in the uncomfortable position of having to tell them that so if you're not ready to become a consent warrior then let someone else do it for you <laughs> and tara maybe we'll set up a number where we can just lecture people about consent like they can just give them our number i would love right? to do that <laughs> our show number and then whenever we get a number a call on that phone we can be like hello are you a consent violator let's have a chat <laughs> I could just see somebody calling it and then getting that answer and just like, hang up. <laughs> <laughs> yep. I'm like, oh, so you can say no. <laughs> uh huh. You get to make a choice. But that girl who you harassed for her number, she didn't have a choice. She yeah. had to give it to you. Yeah. Congratulations, consent violator. Ugh. Ugh. <laughs> I love that. That's awesome. I love that you brought that up, Sylvie. Although this podcast is about sex, I love that you brought up the fact that um, boundaries also are uh, to be uh, set outside of, you know, uh, a relationship or intimate relationships. Yeah, that that has also like practicing my boundaries in my sexual life has, you know, expanded outside of that as well. So, mm -hmm. yeah, that is true. Like being able to say no to friends and family members and workers, you know, coworkers and clients, <laughs> you know, that's also a major one. Clients I have become so much better with my clients 
at setting boundaries. So it feels really good. And I know that this show was not actually supposed to be about consent. It was supposed to be like the lessons that we learned in, in our retreat, but also what makes a luscious lover. So yeah. going from what feels ick in our body to what feels yum in our body. Mm-hmm. Do either of you have a yummy story that you can tell us that maybe maybe it was since the intensive or maybe before the intensive or mm. a current thing that feels really yum in your body when it comes to a current lover and I can see Solas doing yeah, she, dance. she's dancing <laughs> she's dancing <laughs> so do so, you want to so, yeah you go yeah, ahead <laughs> yeah because I have a fresh one just from last night so it's all fresh and yeah as I was saying this reconnection with my amazing lover it's it's so good because as I said I'm in a different place now and so I'm also bringing it some tools for him to learn from from what I've been learning so it's been really fun to bring those tools and and guide him through consent okay so an example last night I was on the bed and he was standing by the bed and I was going to play with brushes that I, that I brought with me, paint brushes. So I was going to play with the paint brushes on his body. And he said, where would you like me to be? But as he said that, he started coming onto the bed and I was like, whoa, I'm like, wait, you just asked me where you want me, when, where you want, where you want me, no, where you want where I want you to be. Where I want you to be. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my, oh my. Okay. Where, yes. Okay. So I'm like, I didn't tell you yet. So, so he backed away, you know, and he stood there. And, and I was like, yeah, I'm like, this is where I want you to be right now. I want you to be kind of like away from me, not on the bed, quite close, quite so close to me. And so, and that's how I started playing with the paintbrushes. And It felt so yummy in my body to be able to express myself like that when before I would would have let him come onto the bed and not that it's like a bad thing, but at that moment, that's not what my body wanted. My body wanted to have that experience of him being on the floor standing and um, me, you know, painting his, his body with my paintbrushes, being on the bed, you know, me being on the bed. So that was very, that felt very luscious uh, to me. And also slowing down. That's also something that I have, have practiced a lot. (laughs) Slowing down is so amazing. It allows us to feel things so deeply. Like I love to be taking in everything, like, the touch, you know, just slowing down the touch, touching your partner's, your lover's body very, very, very slowly and smelling your partner's body also. I love to smell. I mean, it might not be the case for everybody, but for me, I do. I love smelling the body and yeah, just taking things really, really, really slow feels very luscious to me. And eye gazing, eye gazing while we're talking and being fully there, fully present. Um, There's no phones out, phones are put away. Being an attentive listener, really paying attention to each other and and holding space too. It's something that I've never experienced before with the man that I had in my life because they were not interested in holding space for me, you know? This particular lover is, so... I can say anything that I want to say and he he's there to listen and pay attention. And sometimes, or last night at some point I said something and I was like, Oh, I'm sorry. You know, like, I don't know what I'm, why I'm bringing this up right now. And he was like, it's okay. Like, I like to listen to you, you know? So having that, yeah, having that support Mm -hmm. and, you know, that validation it's for me, it's, it's what makes a, a lover luscious. Mm-hmm. I love that. Mm-hmm. Professor Dan Siegel, who is a neurobiologist, 
Professor Dan Siegel, who's a neurobiologist, has a book uh, on the mind. And he talks about, he he has this equation, which I love, and I actually apply it to sex bond as well as to other things. But he says that atten- intention plus attention equals integration. Mm-hmm. And I think when we put our intent and our attention together, whether it's for sex or for a conversation or for being fully present into what we're doing for work, as long as we're marrying an intention and our attention, we are getting probably the best result. Mm-hmm. And for me, that is what makes a luscious lover. It's somebody who's coming at you with intent and fully focused. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's interesting you say that, Sylvie, because I find a lot of times like lifestyle swinger people will say, don't go in with an intention. Mm. And I'm like, but you are. Like there is one deep down, like either you want to fuck somebody or you want to try a different fantasy or you're looking for a way to spice up your marriage. Like there's an intention. Mm -hmm. You're just not, you're not going into it like, oh, whatever, don't care, anything, whatever happens, I'm happy with. And it's like. Your intention is to be open to the situation. If anything, it's my intention is to go in and remain open. So that is an intention in and of there you itself. Go. Yeah. But so also cool. when it comes to touch, no one wants to be touched in a way that lacks intention. Yeah. Right? Like a touch that doesn't have intention, whether that's, you know, yes, an intention doesn't so have to true. be sexual, right? Yes. Like the intention could be if you if you have a friend who's crying and you intend to comfort them, then the intention behind your touch is comforting touch and if you put that intent and your attention on your friend who is crying, they will feel comforted by that touch because there was that intent behind it. If somebody is touching you and you're not quite clear on what the intention is, that that touch can feel confusing and often ick. Or if because, they're distracted. Because then you have to decide what is their intention with this touch mm-hmm. and whether they're fully present or not. And it leaves too much room And that doesn't feel like a container that's being held for you. And it doesn't feel good or safe. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We're all just like sitting here processing this. Mm. (laughs) (laughs) Curious. (laughs) Thank you so much. No, it's true. Intention and attention. So, so true. Like, so what are some tips then if somebody's listening to this podcast and they're like, well, I, I'd like to be a luscious lover. What what are some tips that, or or just like personal preferences even that you have when it when it comes to like what makes a really good luscious lover? And this could be like before getting intimate, like meeting on Tinder for the first time or between the sheets or after as part of aftercare. What are some things that really stand out to you? So Les had a really good one earlier about the phone, putting away your phone. Yes. Yeah. That's because so Les is also a teacher and she has this whole like put away your phones thing, which is cool. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But also getting to getting to know each other, I think, is is super important before even being intimate. Like making the effort to to get to know each other i think for me is like the first thing when i meet someone like i don't want to go straight to being intimate even if that doesn't mean sex right intimate doesn't necessarily mean sex but just taking some time to know each other before we can because again you know it's like what is your body saying when you are Mm -hmm. around that person does your body really feel safe? Do you feel that you can trust? Do you feel you can open yourself up? What is your body saying? Again, you know, it's like going back to our senses and our intuition and feeling things. And then next step is being intimate without the sex part, just playing, you know, for play. 
what can we do to make each other aroused? Last night we had cheese and salami and I fed him a piece of salami and while the bread was toasting, we we're just like chatting in the kitchen and touching each other a little bit and kissing each other, you know, and just, this is to me, this is actually like my favorite part. The before yeah, the sex, before penetration is like everything that comes before that and makes me want, you know, makes me want it, <laughs> you know, and it's like, it's the buildup. I love it so much, you know, so yeah, playing, playing, bringing, bring toys and, you know, as I said, feeding each other. I had also brought my journal last night with some of the questions that we're going to talk about today on this podcast and I asked him those questions I was like oh let's play a game I'm gonna ask you some questions and see what you you know what you would answer to that and you really enjoy that and that also that also brings in more intimacy into the you know into the relationship I'd rather do that than watch a movie that's my preference I would like you know I'd rather do that I'd rather read a book out loud to my lover before we have sex and then watch a movie. Like, I feel like there's such a different level of intimacy with that, you know? Like, mm -hmm. so those are things that personally I enjoy before sex. What about you, Tara? Mm, I think one thing that really stands out to me is like when you're getting intimate or having sex or foreplay, I really appreciate like the person I'm with, my lover, to do like check-ins and not like, is this too hard? Like, mm -hmm. how is this touch feeling? Do you want this softer, harder? Is there something I can change? Like kind of how we do with body work, but that brings me back into my body and also helps me not endure touch because I might be like oh like they're trying and I'll just go along with it but that really encourages like the communication to really get what I want from it and makes it way way more special and stand out more and like I had this girlfriend for a few years and she was really good at that, like always using the consent kind of, and I call it consent because she she would be like, can I massage your breasts? And I'm like, yeah, please. And, but even just that asking, like it just de-armored me and helped me to really, and this was before SSE and helped me to really check in with my body. And I felt really safe and open and when you're feeling safe and listened to, chances are you're going to be more adventurous between the sheets too and willing to try things with this person because there's a sense of trust. And so we tried a lot of fun things together. And it was because I I trusted her to check in and ask. And we really mirrored each other with that whole consent aspect. And it's still a relationship I grieve because I haven't been able to find another lover quite like that. <laughs> mm. And some people don't like consent, right? So coming from the kink world, we have consensual non-consent because there are some people who are just like, just don't ask me that that isn't hot for me. But I want to give you ahead of time the consent to not ask me for my consent ahead of time. Mm -hmm. And as long as that is worked out and that is negotiated, and you're with someone where you feel safe and you feel protected, then again, like have at it, you know, whatever your needs are. And if your needs are, my God, that sounds exhausting to tell someone every time they're going to touch a new body part that I need, like that I want them to touch that body part. For some people, I mean, I'll include myself in that. I would not like that. I'd be like, can you just not ask and just do it? Right. But then that's something that needs to be brought up ahead of time Yeah, and sort of say, my preference is that you don't ask me every time you touch a new body part. Just touch me and trust me to let you know if I don't want you to be touching that body part. Right? Because everyone is going to have different preferences when it comes to that. And that is, again, where we come back to intention and attention. There is nothing worse than someone who is distracted in their own 
feelings and sensations and not in yours if they are touching your body. Like you want their attention to be focused also on their grounding and what they're doing and how it feels to be touching you, but also on you and how your facial expressions, how your movement is, how, you know, whether you're connected, whether you seem dissociated, that they can pay attention to what is going on for you. And when they do those check-ins, that they can do it mindfully in a way that feels good to you and that is respectful of all of the information that they know about how you like to be checked in on. And if they know that you don't like to be checked in on, maybe they could just pull back and see if you pull them in again, right? So just making sure that they that they are attentive, I think is probably number one. Yeah, and having these conversations beforehand. Mm-hmm. Like not many people do. You're lucky if you have like, the sexual health discussion, you know, oh, yeah. in, in most cases, let alone what do you need from me when I'm touching you? Mm-hmm. Like, and I think if we normalized having more of those conversations, I think there would be more people feeling like they would, like they have luscious lovers. Yeah. You know something else I think that sets apart a good lover from a not so good lover in my experience is someone who also enjoys the touch that they're giving. Mm, Yeah. That isn't just giving the touch for you, but they're actually touching you for them and for you at the same time, that they are enjoying whatever it is that they're doing. So if they're going down on you, that you can tell that they're enjoying it if they're touching you or kissing your neck, that they're also enjoying that, that they're not just doing it and being like, did you like that? Was that good? (laughs) That's sort of like, oh, this is only for me, right? Okay, so you're not enjoying it as well. And that sort of shared mutual enjoyment, I think for me is also something that makes an experience luscious. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Is there anything else that feels like it needs to be shared? Because we have some Instagram questions that I'd like to get to before we end the show. Let's go ahead with the Instagram questions. Okay. Okay. My body wants to know. (laughs) So I'm going to start with this one because I kind of like it. How do I talk to my partner slash lover about what I need changed because I don't feel like I'm getting what I need? I teach a whole communication style for people to approach their partners with this kind of relationship, uh, this kind of uh, question, sorry. But it would take too long. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, because it comes down to sexual dialogue. Yeah, and it's like, you know, you don't want the other person to feel like they're doing something wrong. You don't want to shame them. So I think it's important to approach your partner with that kind of language first, you know, like, okay, you're not doing anything wrong, you know, Mm -hmm. Um, I'm talking for myself, it has nothing to do with you, but would you be willing to try this for me? I really would like to experience this. Would you be open to trying this for me? Mm -hmm rather than pointing the finger and saying, which a lot of people do, unfortunately, you know, like, or they'll, they'll remove themselves from the relationship or they they'll give the cold shoulder, you know, like passive aggressive. A lot of people do that because they just don't know how to express themselves. And by doing that, they're causing more damage, damage than anything else. So, yeah, I think, I think the, the way we approach our partners and, the things that we say can help change things around for the best. Yeah, mm-hmm. It's just a matter of, of being cautious and careful in how we formulate our needs and desires. Tara, how would you answer that question? Mm. Yeah, I like what Salah said about like removing them from it and I like to really use like the I feel and so, or I notice I'm noticing in my body that, that 
when you're penetrating me, sometimes it's really hard and like short thrusts and just describe and be like, and I notice like my body really clamps up and I'm not able to really enjoy that as much as I want to. So maybe next time, can we like just try really going slowly and, and I can share with you what that, what that's doing to my body and what I'm noticing. And yeah, I, it's, I mean, it depends what it is too. Right. I just use that as an example Yeah, because I've had, I've had people tell me, you know, I don't like when my partner does this or my lover. And I'm like, well, why are you enduring like Jack rabbit thrusting? (laughs) If you don't like it, how long have you been enduring this? (laughs) Right. Yeah. 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 And and people just don't know, like we're not taught how to have good sex and be good lovers. It's something that we learn from experience. And if people are learning from fucking porn on Pornhub, like chances are it's not setting you up to be the best lover that you can be, Mm -hmm. which kind of like leads me into the other question. Someone said, what are some resources? And I wanted to mention omgyes.com. OMG, yes. Mm -hmm. That's a good one. It's worth paying the money. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Another know. good resource is find a local sexological body worker in your yeah. area. Find a sexological body worker in your area mm-hmm. and figure out what is hot for you mm-hmm. to your body. We pleasure map. Mm-hmm. We we do all kinds of different kinds of touches and sensations that maybe you have been too afraid to ask for, maybe you haven't been able to ask it from a partner that you've been with for a long time, maybe you're afraid of hurting their ego, maybe it just feels different coming from someone else. Maybe there's something that you've wanted to explore for a while, but you just haven't had the vocabulary to be able to ask it. And that is what we are for. That's what Tara and Solas and I, that's what we do for a living. We help you to map your body for pleasure and figure out what feels good for you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Any other resources? Other resources? So last, do you have any other resources that you like to share with clients? Books? Mm -hmm. Yeah. A lot of books. books. So I have so many books, yeah. Um, Open Her by Karen Brody, Reclaiming Eros, well, actually, this one is more about like sexological body workers. Um, the Art of Receiving and Giving. I was going to mention that one. By Betty Martin, I'm sure all of us as sexological body workers recommend this book. We have to. It's yeah. just a staple, right? And there's fun offerings to do with your partner. It's not just reading. Like there's games and exercises mm-hmm. to really embody mm-hmm. what she's teaching. So mm-hmm. that's why I like it. Mm-hmm. Like it's not just reading a book. It's the somatic part of being a somatic sexological body worker and a somatic sex coach yes. is that we actually don't just internalize the information through our brain. We use muscle memory in our body and we we do the thing. So doing the thing is important. And I would say that also, you know, now that, well, it is always difficult in winter because COVID sees a resurgence every time in winter, but going to workshops going to places that have consent workshops or speakers come in and where you can actually actively engage with other people in those spaces is another great resource. Look up your local sex educators, see what classes they're offering and see if any of them are in-person classes where you get to do exercises with other people and track your own nervous system, get used to tracking what it feels like to be in a space with other people where you are actively engaging with your bodies Mm -hmm. and be able to ask questions and track your own sensations. Yeah. Yeah. All great resources. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I'd like to give Salaz some time to share where you can find her website or Instagram, whatever you want to share. This is your time to shine. So passing the torch. Thank you. 
Yes, um, I am. I have not been very good at adver advertising myself, so I don't have a website currently. Um, I'm waiting for 2023 to build it. It's been on my to-do list. Uh, it will be up in 2023. Right now, the only place you can find me is on Instagram at somatic underscore solas three three three, and that's where I post most of everything that I do. You can schedule a call with me. We can do online sessions. And if you happen to be in Hawaii, uh, then we are close and uh, we can get together in person. I do ends on ends in uh, treatments. And yeah, if you have any questions, you can slide into my DM. Hmm. <laughs> <laughs> Um, yeah thank you <laughs> yeah and thank you for coming on today it was kind of we're all in different time zones so it was very confusing yeah <laughs> <laughs> before we started this <laughs> but we made it work and I'm so happy we did because this has been a terrific conversation full of lots of juicy stuff it has been yeah and I don't Sylvie do you want to take us out um, do I want to take you out? Do, well, do, <laughs> yeah, you do. <laughs> we all want you to take us out, Sylvie. Yeah. There are several ways you can interpret that. <laughs> Some of them are more threatening than others, I guess. Um, but yes, I will take you all out. And until next time, claim your pleasure, own your body, and stay in presence. <laughs> Um, yeah, so we are going to wrap up. Thank you to all the listeners for tuning in to the Sex Ed for the Modern Bed Show. If you're looking for more ways to connect, you can get social with us. The show's Instagram is the.sexed.show and our individual Instagrams are Sex Ed for the Modern Bed and Sex and Sensibility, but the E in the sex is a three. That's for Sylvie. And I, Sylvie, do you want to like drop your website or something? Yeah. So my website is www.mysexandsensibility.com. And the E is the normal way in the website. And it's only a three on Instagram because Zuckerberg sucks. But apart from that, yeah. <laughs> That's why I get shadow banned all the time. <laughs> That's why. <laughs> if you can't find us on Instagram. That's why. Yeah. You just have to spell it all out and then it will show up. But that's how you know you shot a bat. So thank you again, listeners. And until next time, claim your pleasure, own your body, and stay in presence. Bye.